So uh, the general question that motivates this talk is as follows. Given compact length spaces x1 and x2 with a common universal cover x tilde, do they have a common finite cover? So we have a diagram like this, x tilde is the universal cover of x1 and x2, and we're asking, does there exist some finite or compact guy here that also covers x1 and x2? Uh, and when I talk about covers here, I mean covers which locally preserve the, the metric of the length spaces. Okay, so let's see some examples. Uh, we'll, we'll see that we get different answers depending on which examples we're looking at. So let's start by considering the case where x1 and x2 are closed hyperbolic surfaces. So here they will have common universal cover, the hyperbolic plane. Is there a common finite cover? <clears throat> well, in this case, uh, there generally won't be. Uh, and this is even if x1 and x2 are homeomorphic. So it might be, for instance, that x1 and x2 are both surfaces of genus 2, but they have different hyperbolic metrics on. And it could be in such a way that there's no common finite cover. Uh, so why is this possible? Um, well, there, there are probably a number of ways to see it, but one way is by thinking about cardinality. Um, so we know that there are uncountably many hyperbolic metrics that you can put on a genus two surface, say. So this corresponds to the, the moduli space. Um, but on the other hand, if you fix a hyperbolic surface, then there are only countably many finite covers. And hence, uh, it shares a common finite cover with only countably many other hyperbolic genus two surfaces. Um, so there must exist a pair x1, x2 uh, that do not have a common finite cover. Uh, let's move up a dimension to hyperbolic three space. Uh, so now x1 and x2 are closed hyperbolic three manifolds. Is there a common finite cover now? Um, and in this case, the behavior is very different. Uh, we actually have um, a necessary and sufficient condition for the existence of a common finite cover. And this condition says that the fundamental groups of x1 and x2 are abstractly commensurable. Um, so this means that the fundamental groups contain isomorphic finite index subgroups. Uh, so this is a, a situation where we're, we're characterizing the existence of a common finite cover using algebraic information, so information about the fundamental groups. Um, so one direction of this equivalence is uh, quite easy to see, and it sort of holds for any sorts of spaces. Uh, so this is if you, if you first assume that there is a common finite cover, then um, this common finite cover will give you isomorphic finite index subgroups in the fundamental groups. So it implies that the fundamental groups are abstractly commensurable. This is always true. Uh, the remarkable thing for this example of um, hyperbolic three space is that you can go the other direction. Uh, and this is due to Mostow rigidity. Okay, uh, for the next example, we'll do something of a different flavor. It will be a more combinatorial example. Uh, so here we'll consider x1 and x2 to be finite graphs, which are covered by the same tree. So x tilde is a tree now. Uh, and this time, the answer is much simpler. It's just yes. Um, if, if your two finite graphs are covered by the same tree, then there must be a common finite cover. <clears throat> 
uh, and this was proved by Leighton in the 80s. And the proof of this is not too difficult, in fact. It's, you can write it down in like one page or so, and it's quite a um, constructive proof. You're, you're really building a common finite cover um, by sort of piecing together different bits that, that locally look like x1 and x2. Uh, but it's a, a neat result. So how might we generalize this example? Well, we could take the finite graphs and uh, kind of thicken them up a bit into simplicial complexes, say. So, so now x1 and x2 are simplicial complexes with three fundamental groups. So they, they have the same fundamental groups as graphs. Uh, and if two of these have a common universal cover, x tilde, then x tilde must be a quasi-tree simplicial complex, meaning that it's quasi-asymmetric to a tree. Uh, is there a common finite cover in this case? Uh, and the answer is again, yes. Uh, and uh, this was something that I proved in my uh, PhD uh, with my supervisor, Martin Brideson. So what other examples are good to consider? Uh, what about a product of trees? So this time, the, um, the spaces downstairs, x1 and x2, will be finite, non-positively curved square complexes. Um, is there a common finite cover in this setting? Um, and this time, the answer is no in general. Um, so there are examples due to Berger, Moses, and Wise, um, where you can take x1 to be a complex which has residually finite fundamental group, and x2 to be a complex with non-residually finite fundamental group, but both are covered by the same product of trees. Um, so this then provides an obstruction to the existence of the common finite cover uh, because the, the property of being residually finite or, or not residually finite passes to, to finite covers. Um, however, there is a subclass of these square complexes where we do get a positive answer. So we do get a common finite cover if x1 and x2 are both virtually special, uh, which follows again from some work of Wise. Um, so, right, so being special, this is a, a property of, um, of cube complexes, which is to do with the, the geometry of hyperplanes. And virtually special means that there's a finite cover which is special. Um, so yeah, th these special and virtually special complexes are sort of well studied in the literature. They're <clears throat> an important class of, uh, of cube complexes. Um, I won't give the, the definition in this talk, um, but a bit later on in the talk, there will be a, an important property of virtually special cube complexes. Um, <clears throat> and, and really that property is the thing which is most relevant to these questions of of common finite covers. So we'll, um, we'll see that a bit later on. Um, but yeah, for now, just think of it, this is a, a nice subclass where we do get this, this positive answer of a common finite cover existing. Okay, so we've looked at trees, products of trees. The, the final entry in the table will be something that generalizes this further. Uh, and it will be the, from the title of the talk, we will look at the case of X tilde being a right-angled building. Uh, so now X1 and X2 will be finite, non-positively curved cube complexes. They, they might not be square complexes because they might have uh, higher dimensional cubes in them. Um, and is there a common finite cover? 
uh, we're going to get the same answer as we did for a product of trees. But yes, there is uh, in the case where x1 and x2 are both virtually special. Uh, this is my new result. Uh, so I should say that some cases uh, of this were dealt with by Hagland, Huang, and uh, Woodhouse. Okay, uh, so I'll, uh, yes, an, an important remark about this. I'll go on to explain what right angle buildings are in a, in a minute. Um, but first, uh, a remark is that if the right angle building X tilde is Gromov hyperbolic, then this condition about being virtually special, but X1 and X2 being virtually special, um, then that will be satisfied automatically. Uh, this is a, a theorem of Eagle. Uh, so in the, in the particular case when X tilde is Gromov hyperbolic, uh, it's just a simple answer of yes, that, that X1 and X2 will always have a common finite cover. So may I ask a quick question right here? Uh, uh -huh. In this results, when X1 and X2 both have a uh, virtually special, is this finite cover also virtually special, which exists? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so right angled buildings. Um, I'll, I'll give a, a definition and a, a picture in a minute, but I want to first recall some examples that um, some of you may have seen before. Um, so they include the Davis complex of any right angled Coxeter group. Um, they also can uh, include the universal cover of the Salvetti complex uh, of any right angled Artin group. Or, well, technically the, the subdivision of that, basically the same. Um, and then there are also many Fuchsian buildings, which are examples of right angle buildings. Now, I'll come back to talking about those a bit later on. Um, so there, there are lots of examples and these are complexes which have been kind of well studied. Um, right, so some definitions. Uh, we'll start by defining what a graph product is. Uh, so the, the setting here is we have a finite graph G uh, with vertex set that we call I. And then we have a finite group GI uh, for each vertex I. Okay, uh, and then the, the graph product associated to this data is a group gamma defined by first taking the free product of the vertex groups GI, and then quotienting out by the commutator GI, GJ, whenever I and J are adjacent vertices in the graph. Um, so this means that GI and GJ will be commuting subgroups of the graph product gamma. Um, uh, so note that the particular case when the, the vertex groups GI have order two, uh, then this is precisely the definition of a right angled Coxeter group. Okay, so that's a graph product. Um, we want to now define right angled building. Um, but in, instead of giving the, the general definition, I will instead draw a picture of a right angle building for a particular example. Um, but I'll explain sort of what the different parts. <clears throat> I'll explain uh, how we build the picture. So this should give you a good idea about what the uh, what these things are in general. Um, okay, so for our example, we will take the graph G to be as shown with vertices i, j, k, and l. So it doesn't need to be a connected graph, for instance. Uh, and then we will label the vertices with numbers according to the orders of the vertex groups. 
uh, for instance, here we're going to say that GI has order two. So if we put a number two next to the vertex I. Okay, so now we start to construct the right angle building, uh, which I'm going to call delta. So we start with what's shown in red, which is called a chamber. Uh, and this has vertices which are labeled by cliques in the graph G, uh, where we also include the empty set as a clique. Um, so, so we have a vertex in the middle labeled by the empty set, and this is joined to the, the vertices uh, labeled with cliques of size one, which are just the, the vertices of G, I, J, K, and L. Uh, and then the, the cliques of size two correspond to the edges in G. So the chamber has vertices labeled IJ and JK, as shown. Um, and the, the squares that you see in this chamber, you, uh, you should imagine these as being filled in. So these are cells. Uh, and then those are all of the cliques in this example. If there were triangles in the graph, then um, those would be cliques of size three, and that would give rise to three-dimensional cubes in the chamber uh, and so on. But I'm sticking with a, a two-dimensional example here. Okay, so this is a chamber, which is a finite complex. Uh, then to, to construct the whole of the building delta, we will take a collection of copies of this chamber uh, and glue them together in a certain way. Um, and we're going to do this such that the group gamma, uh, the graph product gamma from the previous slide, acts on the building delta um, so that it preserves the structure of chambers and it acts simply transitively uh, on the set of chambers. Okay, so let's add to the picture now by drawing some additional chambers. Um, let's first think about the action of the vertex group GI. Uh, so for this, we look at the subcomplex of the chamber where the letter I appears, which is this left-hand boundary in blue. Uh, and the action of GI will be to reflect about this boundary. So it reflects the red chamber onto a green chamber as shown here. Uh, and then we can then label the vertices of this green chamber uh, in such a way that the, the labels are respected by the reflection. Uh, and then GJ will be a similar story, but this time it will reflect about the, the top boundary of the red chamber, which is where the, the label J appears. Um, and these are both groups of order two, so they only contain one non-trivial element. Uh, so let's now look at GL. This is order three. Um, so it will permute between three different chambers. So the red chamber and the two below. Uh, and these will be joined at the vertex labeled by L. Um, so that the action of GL will kind of look like a rotation commuting between these three chambers. Uh, and then finally, GK again has order three. So it will kind of be a rotation between the red chamber and the two chambers on the right, uh, which are all joined along the right hand boundary of the red chamber. So these are the chambers that we get to by applying um, an element from one of the vertex groups. Uh, but of course, we want an action of the whole of gamma on delta. So we need to also consider products of elements from different vertex groups. Okay, so for instance, you might act by GI and then act by GJ. So this will take us to another chamber uh, shown in the top left of this picture. Um, and observe here 
that i and j are adjacent vertices in the graph g so the groups gi and gj will commute with one another hence it doesn't matter whether you apply gi first or whether you apply gj first either way it will map the red chamber onto this top left chamber uh, and so the, the kind of four reflections that i've shown here will form a um, kind of commutative diagram of reflections Uh, and then similarly, GJ and GK, uh, if you do one followed by the other, you get to the two chambers in the top right, as shown. Um, and this is as much as I'll draw, but you can imagine that you can apply longer and longer products of elements from different vertex groups to get more and more chambers. And the, the picture keeps branching out infinitely in this case. Um, so that gives you some idea of what these right angle buildings look like. Um, and if you've seen the, the Davis complex for a right angle Cox to group before, it's a, a very similar picture. Uh, sort of the only difference is that these right angle buildings can have more branching going on because you could have these, these larger vertex groups. They're, they're not just all the two vertex groups. Uh, but other than that, it's a similar picture. Okay, so next I would like to um, sort of reformulate my main theorem uh, in terms of lattices and commensurability of lattices, as was in the title. And this will give us a slightly more general theorem, in fact. Um, so let's do some, <coughs> uh, some reformulation here. Uh, Okay, so starting with finite cube complexes x1 and x2 with universal cover delta, as we had in the table. Um, we can then consider the fundamental groups of x1 and x2 as subgroups of the automorphism group of delta. Uh, so these will just be the groups of deck transformations of the uh, covering maps from delta to x1 and x2. Uh, and then some terminology, we can say that pi1 x1 and pi1 x2 are uniform lattices in or delta uh, because they act properly and co-compactly on delta. Uh, so the, the terminology is referring to some topology on the group or delta, but for the purposes of this talk, you can just take the definition of uniform lattice to mean that the group acts properly and co-compactly on delta. Okay, so these, these deck groups are uniform lattices. Um, so let's now consider the case where there exists a common finite cover, so denoted Y here for X1 and X2. Um, if this exists, then you can draw a commutative diagram of covering maps as shown. Um, and from this, you can um, come up with an equivalent statement for the existence of, of the common finite cover Y. Um, so <clears throat> what is this equivalent statement? So it's saying that there exists an automorphism G of the building such that conjugating pi one x one by G and intersecting it with pi one x two is a subgroup of finite index in um, G pi one x one G inverse and pi one x two. Okay, so this this automorphism G will correspond to the map at the top of this diagram, um, and this intersection of uh, subgroups is going to correspond to the um, the deck transformation group of a covering of the complex Y. Uh, so you kind of need to stare at the diagram and think a little bit to convince yourself that, that these are equivalent statements. Um, they, they indeed are. Uh, and then there's a piece of terminology again for this right-hand statement, 
So here we say that the lattices pi one x one and pi one x two are weakly commensurable in Oort delta. Um, if the element G was the identity, then we would say that they're just commensurable in Oort delta. Uh, so yeah, weakly commensurable is has this added flexibility that you're allowed to, to conjugate one of the lattices in order to make it commensurable with the other one. Um, right, so, so this is what uniform lattices are, and this is what weak commensurability is, um, which I'm going to use uh, in the, um, the more general version of my theorem. which is as follows. Uh, so let lambda in all delta be a uniform lattice. Then lambda and gamma are weakly commensurable. So th this gamma is referring to the, the graph product gamma that we saw earlier. Um, these are weakly commensurable in all delta if and only if all convex subgroups of lambda are separable. Um, okay, so there are a couple more things that need definitions here uh, before we can understand this. So convex subgroup of lambda, uh, H in lambda is convex if it stabilizes and acts co-compactly on a convex subcomplex of delta. Okay, so you can think of these as the subgroups that interact well with the cubical geometry of delta. Uh, these, are, these are the subgroups we care about in, in this context. Uh, and then finally, separable. A subgroup H in lambda is separable. If for any element lambda, which is inside lambda, but not inside H, there exists a homomorphism F from lambda to a finite group, such that f of the element lambda is not an element of f of h. Uh, and we can think of the homomorphism f here as separating the element lambda from the subgroup h. But it's, it, it's separating it in this finite group. Okay, so. We're, we're characterizing weak commensurability with this special lattice gamma in terms of separability of convex subgroups. Um, so it's a, it's kind of both algebraic and geometric. Like separable subgroups is something algebraic, but there's also some geometry because we we only need to consider the, the convex subgroups. Um, so I yes, I wanted to have a short aside where I talk a little bit more about separable subgroups um, and why this is something which is uh, a very useful um, property to have when you're trying to build finite covers with, with certain properties. So I have a little kind of toy example here. Um, suppose that there is a, suppose you've got a finite complex X and suppose that there is a subcomplex which looks like a Mobius strip, as shown. Uh, and let lambda be the loop that goes around the Mobius strip. Uh, and think of lambda as an element of pi one x. Um, so let's now suppose that the subgroup generated by lambda squared is separable in pi one x. Um, so this then implies, uh, more or less straight from the definition, that there exists a finite regular cover x hat of x, such that um, the element lambda is not an element um, of the subgroup generated by a lambda squared multiplied by pi one of x hat. Okay, um, and if you think about it, this has a geometric interpretation. Um, so it's saying that every lift of this Mobius strip subcomplex to x hat is going to be an annulus. Uh, 
So you've, you've constructed this finite cover such that you're untwisting all of these Mobius strip subcomplexes. Um, or equivalently, these lifts are going to have um, even degree as um, when you restrict the cover to the uh, to these subcomplexes. Uh, so that's kind of a, a toy example of what house separability enables you to build a finite cover with some nice geometric property. Uh, but there are plenty of more complicated geometric properties that you can play a similar game to this. Uh, and this is kind of why it's a, why separability is relevant in this theorem and gives you some idea of how it's used in the proof. Uh, okay, so back to the looking at the theorem. Uh, there are a couple more remarks I want to make here, uh, which uh, concern uh, virtually special complexes. So this will link back to what the version that we saw first in the table. Uh, so uh, first remark here, there exists a finite index subgroup gamma prime in gamma such that the quotient of delta by gamma prime is special. And the second remark is that if the quotient of delta by lambda is a virtually special complex, then uh, it follows that all convex subgroups of lambda are separable. So, uh, so yeah, that's where, that's what links virtual specialness to, to this theorem. Um, and using those two facts, you can actually deduce the theorem from the table uh, from this theorem. Uh, so, so this one is, is indeed the, the more general result. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I, I'm not defining virtually special, uh, but uh, I said there's a, a property that is more important for this talk, and this is exactly that. Uh, that the important property is that all complex subgroups are separable. That this is the this is what virtual specialness gives you, and this is the property which is um, most useful for actually constructing a, a finite cover, common finite cover, uh, or or exhibiting weak commensurability. Um, okay, so let's now talk a bit about Fuchsian buildings. So I have a, a corollary of my theorem, which uses a, a theorem of G. Uh, so it's as follows. If delta has the structure of a Fuchsian building, then any finitely generated group quasi-asymmetric to gamma is actually abstractly commensurable to gamma. So this is a saying that the group gamma is quasi-asymmetrically rigid. Uh, and I have some, some pictures here. Um, yeah, don't worry about all of the, the labels on these pictures. Uh, the kind of the shapes are the important things here. Um, so yeah, this these pictures uh, are kind of illustrate some examples where um, where the building delta can be given the structure of a Fuchsian building. Um, so uh, what we mean by this is that we can put a metric on the building delta where we make each of the squares um, a hyperbolic square. So we imagine it as a, a square that sits inside the hyperbolic plane. We give it that metric. Uh, so this is why in the, the pictures below, each of the squares has um, three right angles. Like if you look at the picture on the left, it has three right angles and one angle which is smaller than a right angle, which is what you need if you're a square inside the hyperbolic plane. Uh, and in fact, the, the small angle is always going to be at one of the vertices labeled by the empty set, one of these um, vertices at the center of a chamber. If you think back to the, 
the picture of Delta that we drew earlier. Um, yeah, so there are various examples where you can put a metric on Delta and make it a Fuchsian building. Um, and okay, if you haven't seen Fuchsian buildings before, it's a, a, a special kind of space where you have lots of embedded copies of the hyperbolic plane, which um, sort of intersect each other in complicated ways. Um, so, so why is this? How is this a corollary? Of the theorem. So it uses the a theorem of Xi, which tells us that uh, if a finitely generated group is quasi isometric to gamma um, or quasi isometric to delta equivalently, then this mystery group must act on the building delta or by isometries. Okay, so from that, you can then. Um, well, the, the next step is to then note that uh, the building is Gromov hyperbolic in this setting. So you can use Eigel's theorem again to, um, to deduce that the convex subgroups of the mystery group will be separable. Um, and then it follows from my theorem that the mystery group is abstractly commensurable to the group gamma. To the, the graph product gamma. Um, so, so that, that's where this comes from. Um, and yes, yeah, so maybe another word about these pictures. So, the, the three pictures here, these are pictures of the, um, the kind of Fuchsian chambers uh, within the Fuchsian building structure. So, each of the squares is a square from the, the cubical structure on delta. Um, but the, the overall shapes you see correspond to the Fuchsian chambers. So you, you end up having branching um, along the, the sides uh, of each of these pictures, but, but no branching on the, in the interior of, of these shapes. Um, so it's, yeah, there's, there's various different cases. You have um, buildings that can be made into Fuchsian buildings. Okay, so Finally, I wanted to say a bit more about uh, some the, the kind of ideas or the steps that go into the proof of the main theorem. So a key step is to construct a lambda invariant groupoid um, consisting of one cubical isomorphism between each pair of chambers in delta. Okay, so um, if you think about the picture that we saw earlier of the building, where we had these reflections between adjacent chambers, and you got kind of commutative diagrams of reflections, um, that's an example of one of these groupoids, uh, except that the groupoid you get there will not be lambda invariant in general. Uh, it will be gamma invariant because it, it corresponds to the action of gamma, but it might not be lambda invariant. Um, so this step is you want to construct some groupoid that looks a bit like that. It's sort of built out of these commutative diagrams of reflections, but you want it to be lambda invariant. Okay, and then what do we do with this? Well, we can use this groupoid to transport the vertex labeling of the base chamber. So this was the, the red colored chamber from earlier to all other chambers. Uh, and this gives an alternative vertex labeling of delta. Um, so, so we now have two vertex labeling as a delta. There's the, the usual one, um, which is going to be gamma invariant. And there's this alternative vertex labeling, which comes from this lambda invariant groupoid. Okay. Uh, so next we, we look at this picture. 
Uh, so given an element lambda in lambda, we can start with the, the red base chamber and map across to some other chamber. And then we can map back to the red chamber using our groupoid. And the composition of this, of these maps will give us an automorphism of the red chamber, which we can call epsilon lambda. Um, and this will actually define a homomorphism epsilon from lambda to the automorphism group of this red base chamber. Um, so yeah, okay, you need to check for this a homomorphism. Uh, I won't explain that, but, but this is where you, you use the fact that, that the groupoid is lambda invariant. Okay, so, so what's the point of this homomorphism? Uh, you can also, you might also want to call this a, a holonomy map. Um, so the point is that we can then consider the kernel of this homomorphism. Uh, and because the base chamber is finite, we know that the kernel will be a finite index subgroup of lambda. Uh, and furthermore, it will preserve this alternative labeling that we have constructed. Um, so why does it preserve the alternative labeling? Uh, this is not so hard to see. Uh, so if, like looking at the picture again, if the element lambda sits inside kernel epsilon, then this means that um, the, the maps from the red chamber to the right-hand chamber, given by lambda and given by the groupoid, it means that these two maps are the same. Um, so I, I guess this is <laughs> the groupoid map going in the opposite direction of what I've drawn in the picture. These two maps from left to right will be the same. Um, and the, this alternative vertex labeling was defined using the groupoid. Therefore, it follows that the element lambda um, would preserve this alternative vertex labeling. Okay, so at this point we have the usual labeling which is preserved by the lattice gamma, and we now have an alternative labeling which is preserved by this uh, finite index subgroup of lambda. Okay, so then the, the final step is to exhibit weak commensurability um, of kernel epsilon and gamma using an, an automorphism G. Uh, and this will be constructed by, um, or this will be an automorphism that transforms the alternative labeling uh, back to the usual one. Okay, so I mean, that there's a, a fair bit of work that needs to go into this final step of really showing that this, uh, you can get weak commensurability using such an automorphism, uh, but this is the, the main idea of how such an automorphism is constructed. It's, you know, you're constructing it in order to map the, the alternative labeling back to the usual one. Uh, and somehow, because these labelings are associated to the two lattices we're working with, this is the right thing that, that gives us weak commensurability. Um, so these are kind of the, the rough steps. Um, yeah, so maybe as some final remarks, I'll point at the, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about which is the difficult step. Um, and this is very much the first step, in fact. Uh, the hard part, the, the heart of the proof really, is coming up with this lambda invariant groupoid. Um, so, yeah, a, a few words about that. Um, to construct this groupoid, I actually construct um, a hierarchy of groupoids, which are defined on a hierarchy of convex subcomplexes of delta. So I kind of start with groupoids on small subcomplexes and sort of work upwards, patching groupoids together to get larger groupoids in, in some way. Um, uh, and at each step of 
going up the hierarchy. Um, it turns out that you actually have to replace lambda with a finite index subgroup. Um, and this is where the separability of convex uh, subgroups comes into the proof. Um, so, so actually what I've written here is a slight lie, this first step. The groupoid might not be lambda invariant, but you will come up with one which is um, invariant with respect to some finite index subgroup of lambda, which is good enough for, for the proof. Um, and yeah, so these, these hierarchy of subcomplexes, maybe that's a final thing. They, um, these subcomplexes roughly correspond to intersections of hyperplanes in delta. Um, so it's, it's kind of the, the natural hierarchy that you would put on a cube complex. Um, it's, yeah, nothing particularly weird there. So, so yes, that's, that's very much the, the difficult step in this proof. Uh, so hopefully that, that gives you some, some idea of what goes into the proof. Um, thanks for listening. <laughs>